So ladies and gentlemen, I think we can get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Armagan Al-Haq. I'm the manager of program development and partnerships at the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy at University of Waterloo. And uh, it's an honor for me to introduce our guest speaker for today. And there's some good news, and I don't want to steal the thunder. Uh, we have a Chevy Bolt outside, and I will let the speaker talk uh, on Chevy Bolt probably in a couple of minutes. So let's, uh, let me do the intro. Uh, so our guest speaker for today is uh, Dave Thompson. He graduated with a Bachelor of Applied Science in Honors Chemical Engineering from the University of Waterloo. So University of Waterloo is like a family to him. While in university, Dave worked as a co-op student at Imperial Oil, GM, Maple Leaf Consumer Foods and Woodbridge Foam Group. Upon graduation, he was hired by Whiting Equipment Canada and worked as a process engineer and project manager designing, selling and managing evaporation, crystallization and drawing capital projects for customers in Canada, United States, India, Argentina, Brazil and Spain. I think that covers all the, the entire world, I guess. Dave currently works as a project manager at Walker Environmental Group, a subsidiary of Walker Industries, where he specializes in developing landfill gas utilization projects, also known as LFG. Walker Environmental is a Canadian leader in resource recovery and waste management with a focus on sustainability, providing coast-to-coast -coast environmental solutions to municipalities and private businesses. Walkers develops and operates environmental and green energy infrastructure for a circular economy. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Dave Thompson. Thank you. Good morning. My name is David Thompson. I work as a project manager for Walker Environmental. and I develop uh, biogas utilization projects. Today I'd like to focus my talk on three uh, landfill gas utilization projects that we're currently developing at our Niagara campus. Um, but first, I want to do a back to basic summary about what Walker Environmental is all about. So, Walker Environmental Group is a fifth generation family owned business dating back to 1887. Um, we are a subsidiary of Walker Industries and we have other divisions that are subsidiaries. So, we are started as a stone cutting business and got into quarrying. Uh, we had these big open uh, you know, uh, quarries and got into the waste management industry in the 70s. Uh, we are still into quarrying under the Walker Aggregates uh, Division, as well as road construction under Norjohn Contracting. And we have uh, Asphalt and wa uh, Wax-Based Emulsions Group. They're located in Burlington, Ontario, also in Portland, Oregon, and Orangeburg, South Carolina. For Walker Environmental, um, our head office is in the Niagara region and we still have a big, big strong presence in that community. Uh, but over the last five years, we've grown substantially. We're over 20 locations across six provinces and uh, most of that uh, has been through acquisitions and most of it on the organic side. So within Walker Environmental, we have uh, three main business units, or organics business, disposal, and the group I'm a part of, Energy and Carbon. So within the organics business, uh, we are the largest fully integrated organics recovery company in Canada. Organic wastes that we manage include food scraps, leaf and yard waste, wood waste, as well as biosolids from wastewater treatment plants, liquid organic waste such as used cooking oil, and grease trap waste. For this business, um, it's essential to match uh, technology and process with the appropriate feedstock and the right market for your product. Our process has to produce value. If not, we're just making a more expensive uh, waste and, uh, and that doesn't help um, overall. So one of our products is a compost product. We do about 65,000 tons of diversion uh, at our Niagara facility. So that is all the green bin waste for the Niagara region. It's also leaf and yard waste from Niagara and Toronto. We receive that organic waste, we grind it, and then we have two methods to create compost uh, down in Niagara. So one is an open windrow, traditional style composting, uh, where the you know, organics gets put in it outside, it gets turned, um, and then you can make a product you know, in six to eight months. 
This is our windrow with a gore system. So that's a Gore-Tex liner that covers the organic waste. It allows um, air to percolate through, but it traps in the odor. And also it speeds up the, uh, the processing of the organics into compost. So running under the concrete uh, pads there, we have channels and we blow air in. And that allows for the, uh, the quicker degradation of the waste in six weeks. We then put it into open windrows. And then a couple of weeks for curing. We screen out any plastics, metals, any large uh, organics that didn't break down, they get recycled back into the process. And then we do some final testing before it's sold. Some of the process monitoring that we, uh, that we do are temperature, moisture, and oxygen to meet uh, strict guidelines. And we sell our product to landscapers, uh, soil blenders, um, in the bulk market. We also produce, uh, under the Alltreat brand, a bagged product. So Alltreat was an acquisition um, a couple of years ago. They uh, do composting similar to us with a Gore facility, and they also have a bagging line. So that way we're able to uh, sell our product uh, in stores under the Alltreat brand or under a third-party private label. Uh, you can find our products, whether it's mulches, soils, compost, stone, um, at Walmarts, Home Hardwares, Loblaws, and Metro grocery stores. Last December, we acquired another organics company, Growbark. Um, they're based in Caledon, Ontario, and they do specialized soils as well as mulches, and they market to horticulturalists. Another division of our organics group is our grinder uh, operation, so we make colored mulches whether that's from skids, pallets, uh, waste wood, trees. Um, all across Ontario, we bring the grinder to the municipality or to the customer and then make the product and sell it. We also um, have a new line uh, called our resource recovery uh, grinding operation. So there we take waste railway ties that used to be uh, put into landfills. We grind it up as a low carbon fuel and we sell it to coke ovens or kilns to reduce their uh, their GHG emissions. So one of the projects that we worked on and we got OCE funding for was to provide Stelco with uh, ground up railway ties that they could use to offset their pet coal uh, in their coking uh, process in Hamilton. Uh, another grinding operation that we have is uh, recycled asphalt shingles. So instead of those asphalt shingles coming into our landfill, we can grind them up and use it as a road base uh, and not use virgin aggregate. We have a biosolids division after acquisition of Enviro. Uh, there are facilities in Niagara, Sudbury, Leamington and Sarnia in Ontario, Banff, Alberta, Summerside PEI and Halifax, Nova Scotia. So what are biosolids? Well, basically everything you flush down the toilet, whether you're at work, at school, at home, uh, goes to wastewater treatment plant. Some processing happens and we're left with dewatered biosolids and then uh, cleaned up water that can be discharged. Traditionally, the biosolids would go to a landfill and you'd have slope stability issues because of the composition of those biosolids. Also, very large odor issues. So what we do is truck it into our facility or we're attached right to a, uh, a water treatment plant like we have in Sudbury. Um, so this is Niagara, where we truck it in from uh, two, two wastewater treatment plants in Niagara Falls. And then this is in Sudbury, where we're attached to their wastewater treatment plant. The dewatered biosolids uh, gets combined with another byproduct, in this case, cement kiln dust, which is a byproduct of the cement industry. It's an alkaline material, so it raises the pH, raises the temperature, kills off any of the bugs or parasites, and we're left with a fertilizer on the back end, which we trademark as an enriched product. Farmers really like our product. They're high in nutrients from the biosolids, and they also help to raise pHs, uh, pH levels of naturally acidic soils or soils that have been damaged from acid rain. So our product can be land applied. Another company we acquired recently, uh, Organic Resource Management Inc. out of uh, Toronto. We've now rebranded as OCR, Organics Collection and Recycling. And we take used cooking oil, grease trap waste, and organics 
um, to feed the anaerobic digester industry for uh, grease trap in organic waste. And then this feeds uh, the biodiesel industry for used cooking oil. So for our organic resource recovery systems, we'll go to um, grocery stores like Loblaws, and when they have expired food or they have cuttings for making salads, that'll go through a milling machine and it'll get uh, grinded down, go into a tank, and then we'll scoop it up with a vac truck. So for all of these, uh, they're all uh, sucked up through a vac truck, and we do some initial pre-processing. So we decant the water, and we filter out any garbage or any contaminants that is in that stream, and then we become feedstock for anaerobic digesters. And digesters like our feedstock because it's high in organics, there's good energy value, and the fats, oils, and greases uh, really have a high energy value for gas production. So from there, an anaerobic digester can produce energy, whether that's um, renewable natural gas or electricity. The digestate uh, has nutrients, so that can go back on to grow food, to go back to the grocery store. And this is a great example how um, we're part of the circular economy. Uh, we start the cycle all, all over again, and uh, instead of being in a linear economy, this is circular. For the operations, we have, um, they're based out of Toronto, but we have operations in Ottawa, Woodstock, and Ontario, Red Deer, Leduc, and Calgary in Alberta, and Vancouver, BC. So traditionally, uh, you know, we've been a waste management company since the 70s, but really waste management doesn't uh, incorporate what we do now. We still have a disposal unit, but our biggest opportunities are in resource recovery and organics diversion, as well as making renewable energy. But we do provide critical infrastructure for our communities in our disposal business. So in Niagara, uh, we have the largest private landfill in Ontario. Uh, we're currently operating the South Landfill, which takes in 1.1 million tons of waste a year. Um, we have a double generic uh, liner system, which is about 12 feet from bottom of bedrock to uh, where we can put waste to protect our groundwater. We also did a remediation project uh, for Rice Road where we installed a leachate, uh, wetland leachate treatment system. Another great news story about successful remediation project was with the city of Welland. So Atlas Steel had closed uh, within the city. Um, they went bankrupt. The city took over all of their land, including their landfill. Um, that landfill was uh, leaking into the nearby uh, waterway. Uh, it was a liability for the, the city of Welland. And we came in and turned that liability into an asset by um, investing all the capital to put in a new leachate system, to fix the liner system, and we take in contaminated soils from all across Ontario to put into that landfill. Every ton of soil that comes in, we pay a royalty to the city of Welland. So before on their books, they had lots of expenses to deal with a liability, and now they have an asset that's producing revenue for the city. So it's a great win-win uh, for us and for them. Uh, at the end of life, which should be the end of this year or early into next year, uh, that area down here will be a recreational use park for the city. Ooh. So one of our larger projects that we're working on, and I have to give a shout out to Becky Oler, who's the consultation manager for our Southwest Landfill Proposal in Zora Township, so that's north of Ingersoll. Uh, Becky helped me put together this Prezi as, uh, you know, I graduated 10 years ago, so I, <laughs> I'm not up and up on Prezis. But uh, they are developing a landfill site uh, just north of Ingersoll that'll be similar to our south landfill in terms of capacity. And uh, just to give you an idea why we need this critical infrastructure, about 3.2 million tons of waste goes to Michigan every year. So we have a landfill capacity issue here in Ontario. A lot of our waste goes to Michigan or New York. Um, this would be helping that situation by having another landfill within Ontario. Um, and we could develop it into a resource recovery campus like we have in Niagara. Um, it's about a 10-year process from the time you decide to site a landfill to the time that, uh, that you actually put waste in place. So we started that process back in 2012. 
and uh, we will be submitting our final EA um, in about a year and a half time. So um, by the time we construct the landfill, get final approvals, uh, it'll be about 10 years to get a landfill sited here in Ontario. For 40 years, we've been involved in waste trucking under Woodington Division. Uh, we truck t over 200,000 tons of waste annually, as well as biosolids and recyclables and green bin waste for the Halton region. We also operate a transfer station in Burlington. Um, going back to basics, so a transfer station is basically taking small trucks that have waste, putting them on the transfer floor and loading them into big, bigger trucks uh, where they go out for disposal. And we also have two residential drop-offs, one in Burlington at our transfer station and one in Niagara. So at the drop-off, residents can bring in their household waste, recyclables, electronic waste, wood waste, as well as shingles and tires to be diverted from landfill. And that's an overall um, look at our disposal business. So the group that, um, that I belong to is our renewable energy and carbon business. Um, by far one of our faster growing uh, businesses um, in Ontario and throughout Canada. And uh, a little bit later, I'll be talking about our three, three utilization projects that we're doing in Niagara. Um, we are, um, have been in this industry for just about 20 years, and we provide leadership in landfill gas utilization and carbon offsets. <clears throat> we do this through a partnership. So Comcore Environmental is based out of Cambridge, and they provide the engineering, design, operations and maintenance for our group. Walker Environmental brings landfill experience, uh, construction management, overall project management experience, and we form a very successful partnership called Integrated Gas Recovery Services, IGRS, um, which all of our utilization projects fall under. Um, this is another good example of how we took a liability, um, in our case, landfill gas odors in the 1990s, and created an, an asset that's uh, generating revenue. So as we were taking in more and more waste that had organics and started producing gas in our landfill, um, we had an odor issue. So we started as taking in soils and taking in refractory sands. Um, when we started taking more organics, a lot of landfills in Ontario did not have gas collection, but Comcore Environmental had done a lot of work in the States putting in these systems. Um, to collect the gas, also to utilize the gas. So we partnered with them, installed a gas collection system in our landfill, started flaring the gas, which immediately reduced our GHG emissions. So even though organics is biogenic, when the methane permeates through the cap at our landfill, it's 25 times the global warming potential of CO2. So just by flaring the gas, we're reducing those CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions. And, um, and we did the right thing early and we were rewarded. So by flaring our gas before we were mandated to, we were given um, carbon offsets that we could sell into the voluntary space. And in 2001, when we incorporated our gas utilization company, we did our first utilization company uh, uh, project with a company that needed to offset some of their natural gas needs. So it was Abitibi, and then it became Resolute Forest Products. They are a recycled newsprint business about four kilometers away. We cleaned up our gas, we pushed that gas to Resolute, and they burned it in their boilers instead of natural gas. That project was so successful, we built another pipeline six uh, years later and started pushing more gas to them. So how do we, uh, how do we get landfill gas? Well, we have our organic content in our landfill and anaerobically it, it, uh, it decomposes, so without any oxygen, and we get about 50% methane in the landfill gas. We also get some carbon dioxide. Nitrogen and oxygen is sucked in through the cap when we pull on our well field, and then we have trace elements such as H2S, siloxanes, and other constituents in our gas. The, uh, the main energy value comes from the methane, um, and we collect the gas by drilling in wells in our well field. 
We then hook up those wells to valves, which we can control how hard we pull on each one of the wells. Uh, they get connected up into a high density, uh, HCPE, high density polyethylene line, which we pull a vacuum on. So that gas can get flared, which is a requirement for any large landfills uh, now in Ontario, or we would prefer to use it as renewable energy. So when it goes up the stack, uh, you know, we're not taking, uh, we're not making beneficial use of that energy that we're flaring. So some of the things that we can do, like with the Resolute project, is direct industrial use where we can burn the landfill gas in an appliance like a boiler uh, instead of natural gas. We call that a medium BTU project because we don't need to upgrade the, land, the methane. So it can be 50% methane and it can still have the heating value that we need in order to produce heat um, for that project. We also generate electricity and currently all of our assets for energy or electricity generation um, goes to the grid under RESOP, so that's Renewable Energy Standard Offer Program or FIT contracts. Um, we have 10, uh, sorry, 15 megawatts of nameplate capacity at four locations. So we have a one megawatt engine uh, down in Niagara. We've got 4.5 megawatts at the Britannia landfill, which is now closed in Mississauga. It's now a, uh, a golf course called the Bray Bend Golf Course, if you've ever golfed there. You'll see our wells sticking up, not on the green or on the fairways, but on the side. Um, we also do 10 megawatts of electricity generation to grid in the Ottawa Valley at uh, City of Ottawa's Trail Road facility and the La Flesh landfill. We know we have a surplus uh, amount of green electricity here in Ontario, so our next objective is to use this electricity to power our own operations or uh, what I'll talk about a little bit later on the GM project, uh, power the operations of our neighbours. Another new development in the landfill gas and biogas industry is uh, high BTU or renewable natural gas projects are becoming more viable as the capital cost of the equipment is coming down. So we can take that 50% methane landfill gas and upgrade it to natural gas quality by scrubbing out the other constituents. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. It can then go into any pipeline network, whether it's TransCanada, Union, Enbridge. It can be wheeled anywhere in North America and be put into a CNG vehicle directly on site or through the pipeline network, and that can reduce GHG emissions uh, by offsetting diesel and gasoline. So carbon, carbon offsets. Been in the news a lot, especially after the last election in Ontario. So we have the Paris climate deal that the Fed signed a couple of years ago. We did have an Ontario cap and trade um, system, and we'll, it remains to be seen uh, the legalities of pulling out right now. There are carbon markets across the world, and in North America, there's still the Western Climate Initiative. So Quebec and California are still under a cap and trade system. BC has a revenue neutral carbon tax, and um, you know Trudeau's push is to have a backstop on a carbon. Uh, cost of carbon throughout the provinces. So we'll see how that uh, comes about. And then we have offset buying and trading on the voluntary and on the regulated marketplace. So what are carbon offsets? Well, there are a decrease in greenhouse gas emissions that can be used to offset emissions created elsewhere. So if you're a company and you do the right thing and you reduce your carbon footprint, there's a chance you could be doing um, something that's part of a protocol where you could quantify those offsets and sell them to other industries that, uh, that have not invested in renewables and reducing their GHG output. So we have been involved since the early 2000s by selling our off get offsets from our landfill gas. Uh, going back to what I said before, methane is 25 times the global warming potential. So by us flaring our gas before we were mandated to, we were allowed offsets in the voluntary space where we sold them. If you ever went on an Air Canada flight and you said, I want to make this flight carbon neutral, you'd be buying our offsets. So that's an overall of the, uh, the three main divisions within Walker Environmental. And now I'd like to focus on uh, our landfill gas utilization, the three projects we're developing currently. So 
So they're all based in our Niagara campus. Um, this is where it all started. In 1887, we started mining out uh, rock over here. And now we've developed a very large campus where it really touches upon everything that Walker Environmental and, and really what Walker Industries does. So we have a closed landfill site, uh, the West Landfill, where we took in foundry sands and contaminated soils. Um, there was no gas produced there, so we were able to build on it. We have the East Landfill, which uh, reached final capacity in 2009. We do add in more waste when we get areas that settle, uh, but our main active landfill is our South Landfill. We have an active quarry across Taylor Road here where they blast stone. They truck that stone underneath Taylor Road through a tunnel system and get to the aggregates processing area where they crush that stone and sell it. We have an asphalt plant, leachate lagoons. Our head office for Walker Industries is located here. Our Walker Environmental Group head office is here. And we have our trucking division based here. We have a biosolids facility, a residential drop-off, and then our compost facility. So here's the gore pads, and then our open windrows. And then we have a grinding uh, pad clean wood site. Within our East Landfill, we did a study with the University of Guelph, where we wanted to take um, unused area of our landfill that had been capped and repurpose it and bring it back to its original use. So before we mined out quarry, and before we put a landfill there, this was agricultural land. We wanted to know if we added in the right amount of soils on top of our cap, could we grow food products for animal feed? And, um, and, what, and what would be the, uh, the effects of that? So we studied it and uh, those findings were very successful. So now we have an agricultural reuse area. Up here on the East Landfill on the other side, this is where we have our grinding division for railway ties, asphalt shingles, um, and some soil blending that we can do. So another opportunity for us to utilize the land that, uh, um, that we have on site uh, to do resource recovery and lower GHG emissions. Our landfill gas operation where we have our flares and utilization is down here in between the east and the south landfill. So we have three projects. The General Motors Landfill Gas Supply Project the Behind the Meter Electricity Displacement Project, and our Renewable Natural Gas Project that we're currently developing. So when I came to Walker, uh, Walker's three and a half years ago, I was basically uh, hired to sell this project. So they handed me a file with one email. They had for years tried to discuss with GM a way that we could use some of our gas that were flaring. And uh, we had the right champion on the GM end. Uh, his name's Du Kuang, their facilities manager, who loved the idea of using the gas that we're flaring to lower his uh, electricity needs and to also reduce their GHGs. So this is the GM St. Catharines uh, propulsion plant. It used to be called the engine and powertrain facility. But like GM and, and us, they know the future is electric. So uh, they renamed a propulsion plant. Maybe they'll be making uh, powertrains for electric vehicles there, like the Bolt I dro drove today. So IGRS is responsible for conditioning the gas and also for running the pipeline between the landfill and GM. And GM is responsible for building the 6.4 megawatts cogen, uh, where they'll create electricity and they'll use the waste heat off the engines to heat their plant in the winter. This is where GM's located. Um, you've got the uh, well and canal here that the Seaway manages. And you've got our operations. So here's our crushers, here's our head office, and our landfill gas plant is just about here. We're gonna be running a pipeline on our side of the property around our uh, head office buildings near our crusher. And then from this point is our demarcation point where we'll uh, horizontal uh, directional drill under the old decommissioned third canal. So that was the canal that they used to run boats in till the 1930s. So we're gonna go under this kidney shaped body of water, pop up on the haulage road, and then open trench cut uh, underneath the CN uh, line. 
and then on to GM property, all the way to the landfill gas to energy facility. We are right now in the permitting phase. Um, I can probably construct this pipeline in less than six months, but it takes over a year to get the permits. So we have been in talks with uh, the Seaway on an easement through their property. So that's a Transport Canada owned um, property there. We also are in talks with CN on the bridge crossing, crossing their line. And then because we're in the Niagara Escarpment area, we need a development permit uh, to do that. So we've done all of our geotechnical, environmental, archeological studies in order to apply for a permit, which we uh, will be doing next month. So all of those were finished uh, last month and they all came back clean, which is, a good, which is good for my project. So in our scope is adding in the wells to collect the gas, the equipment to clean it up, and then GM will put in the landfill gas to energy cogen. Here's a rendering of uh, what that building will look like. They'll be doing 6.4 megawatts of electricity which is about uh, 6,400 Ontario homes, the equivalent of uh, 6,400, and then eight megawatts of thermal. So taking that weight heat off the engine, preheating their boilers instead of using natural gas. One of the next phases of this project that we're talking to GM about is taking that waste heat off the engine, putting it through an absorption chiller, and they can cool their plant in the summertime. So use that waste heat year round. So how are we doing this project? Well, we're pulling the gas using a compressor. These are uh, row flow, 300 horsepower sliding vane compressors. They, uh, they pressurize the gas to 35 PSI so it can go through all of our conditioning equipment and the three and a half kilometers of pipeline to GM. We dehydrate the gas and remove the condensate using a dehydration skid. We'll have a glycol loop on a chiller and some heat exchangers chill that gas down to five degrees, reheat it back up to 30, and as long as that gas stays above five degrees in the pipeline, no condensate will drop out. And we'll remove the siloxanes. So here we've got a siloxane removal skid with a purge flare. These are temperature swing absorption units. So we run the landfill gas through the media in these towers. The silica attaches to the media and in the other tower, we regenerate the media. So we run hot air through it. The silica uh, gets deabsorbed and it gets flared. And then we cycle between the vessels. So why are we doing this? Well, we're supporting GM's renewable energy push as well as their GHG reduction commitments. This project alone, without any other phases, will reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 77% for that plant. It'll be the greenest um, engine plant in their fleet globally. We'll reduce electrical demand from the grid, especially during peak um, days. We'll improve the competitiveness of that plant. So here in Ontario, electricity pricing has gotten higher and higher. Uh, by signing a 20-year landfill gas uh, agreement with us, they'll be able to hedge on what that uh, gas supply cost will be. They'll be able to produce their own electricity. And they also compete with other um, uh, GM plants for capital. So this is a great project for them um, to obtain capital from their head office in Detroit. It avoids flaring and there's beneficial reuse of the gas. And we're supporting Canada and Ontario's GHG reduction commitments. It's also something we can do, not just with automotive manufacturers, but any kind of uh, industry that needs electricity and could utilize waste heat. Whether that's a cement industry, uh, food manufacturer, um, a school, could be the University of Waterloo, Brock University in Niagara. So the next project uh, that I worked on, and uh, are about a year away, from installing is uh, behind the meter energy electricity generation project. So we will install a new uh, Yenbacher 320 engine down here, produce our own electricity, run overhead lines across our landfill and connect with the infrastructure that feeds um, electricity to this side of our campus. So we power the operations at our landfill gas plant. 
So this is where our compressors for the GM project and the blowers for our flaring are located. Also, here's our chiller um, for dehydration. We power our two office buildings on site and our crushing plants, our aggregates processing plant, all with a single one megawatt engine. So this is a Yenbacher 320. Uh, this one's currently installed um, under a resup contract at our Niagara campus. We would do the same preconditioning that we do for the GM project. So we dehydrate the gas, we would uh, have a siloxane removal skid, and then we go into a reciprocating engine where um, it produces uh, the power in the generator, step up transformer, switch gear, and then overhead line. Uh, this is a Yumbacher 320, so it's uh, 20 cylinders, 3 liters per cylinder, so it's a very big engine. Why are we doing it? Helps us lower our carbon footprint and decreases our electricity costs, especially during the five peak days here in Ontario because we are a class A user of electricity. We avoid flaring. And this is the first project we've done where we've powered our own operations off of our uh, landfill gas. We all know that the grid is becoming more and more decentralized with wind and solar. So this helps uh, decentralize the grid, allows us to produce our own electricity close to where it gets used, only a few kilometers away, and we can minimize power losses. And it's a good opportunity for us to showcase the renewable energy projects we do. The last project uh, that we've been working on is our renewable natural gas project. It is by far the most complex project we've ever worked on. Uh, it's in the tens of millions of dollars, I won't say an exact number, and, uh, and millions of dollars in operating costs to put one of these systems in. Uh, it's basically upgrading the gas from 50% methane to pipeline quality, and uh, it's very capital intensive. We're doing it again at our Niagara campus, zooming in. This is an overhead view of our, our current uh, operations, as well as our uh, design uh, for the new RNG area. So over here is where our conditioning and upgrading equipment will be located. And here is the Enbridge injection station where they odorize and inject the gas. They will also check that it meets pipeline quality or else they'll slam a, a, a valve and shut us in. Over here, we've got our new siloxane removal skid, which will remove siloxanes and then it'll go out to General Motors. It'll also backfeed to our one megawatt uh, behind the meter generator. This is the engine here. This is our current engine. And then we're doing a detailed engineering study to add two more engines here to power this operations. So we'll add two more megawatts to take some of the load um, that this new operation will have. This is our flaring and compression uh, building. So our flares are here. We, even though in the next year and a half we'll be utilizing all of our gas that were produced, we still need the capacity to flare the gas in case our operations are out. Within here is where our compressors will be located for the GM project as well as, uh, as the dehydration skid. So what are we doing? Well, we're making pipeline quality RNG by upgrading it. It's our responsibility to bring the gas in and supply it to the skid. We're responsible for adding in the capital and operating the cleanup equipment. And then it'll go into the distribution system, in our case, Enbridge's system. How are we doing it? So we've got 4,000 standard cubic feet of landfill gas at about 50% methane. And we're going to produce 2,000 standard cubic feet of renewable natural gas uh, to feed into the natural gas pipeline at 98% methane. First step, condensate removal. S similar to, uh, to the other projects, just a little bit bigger of a skid. And then we'll have an activated carbon bed for H2S removal and a temperature swing absorption for VOC and siloxane removal. We have uh, decided on a hybrid system for the upgrading and cleanup. So that is a multi-stage membrane for CO2 removal, as well as a uh, pressure swing absorption unit for oxygen and nitrogen. And um, you know, looking at it from a chemical engineering perspective, oxygen and nitrogen are inerts. 
So it makes sense that it's very capital intensive and energy intensive to try to separate that from, from the methane. We have various compressors, uh, very large compressors, to push the gas through um, all of these skids. And we'll have an internal quality check, as well as one by our local da uh, gas distributor. And as I said before, if we don't meet that pipeline quality, they'll slam that uh, valve closed and we won't be making any production. It's very important we hit those quality checks. Um, that gas, once it goes into the pipeline, could be going to a fireplace, a barbecue, um, any number of residential um, uh, buildings or commercial buildings. Um, it could also go to a natural gas fired uh, power plant here in Ontario. It could go to um, a CNG vehicle as well. We're helping to support the green economy here in Ontario and creating new green jobs. And the biggest carbon abatement that you can do with renewable natural gas is to put it into a CNG vehicle. So instead of having um, diesel or uh, gasoline emissions, we can decrease our use of fossil fuels by using RNG. We're avoiding flaring. And this is the first time we've done a renewable natural gas project. We have other sites where we have landfill gas rights that we're looking to, uh, to implement a project like this as well. I'd like to uh, point out a uh, partnership that, uh, research partnership that we have with University of Waterloo, uh, Dr. Simakov and his team. And the premise of this research is to allow us to double our renewable natural gas production by uh, using uh, a reactor instead of uh, upgrading the gas using separation. So within our gas, we have methane, we also have CO2. We could be doing electrolysis on water, adding in hydrogen, and uh, making more CH4, making more methane, uh, uh, instead of separating it and uh, putting it to a thermal oxidizer. The research was focused on picking the right catalyst, which we did early in the, the project, Good job to the team, um, reactor design, and the overall system design. Now, I'm not doing any more differential equations or any research like that, having been graduated. I, I haven't done calculus since I left here. Um, but where I can add value to the team is on the economic evaluations. So I can look at um, what we can sell the RNG for, how can we produce the electricity, whether it's from our landfill gas or other renewables, what markets um, have clean electricity on the grid and uh, have a market for the renewable natural gas? What do steam turbines and reactors cost? How do we, uh, how do we design them? How do we fabricate them? Um, so that's where I add value. But the majority of the work is Dr. Simakov and his team, Sogol, uh, Robert, and Yichen, who are right over here. And I'd like to thank them for all their hard work. That was, it was a good opportunity uh, for industry and academia to partner together. So uh, we got grants from NSERC. We also got grants from OCE for that project. And we're looking to the next steps uh, uh, for demonstration plant or, or eventually to commercialization. So I talked a lot about resource recovery, uh, whether it's landfill gas or organics. I want to show you how renewable natural gas or renewable electricity or biogas utilization is tied into the circular economy. So let's just say you go to the grocery store, you buy some organics, you eat half of it, and the rest goes in your, uh, your garbage, right? Let's say you, you forget to put it in the green bin, because you all put your organics in the green bin, right? So that waste goes to our transfer station or it gets directly trucked to our landfill. We could produce electricity to feed our current operations. We could produce electricity to feed our neighbors, such as GM. Or we can put it to the grid, where it goes back to the grocery store, back to other operations, back to your house. So let's say a company like Loblaws uh, decides to do the right thing with their organics. They contract with uh, OCR, uh, used to be Organic Resource. And th that organics gets trucked by us to an anaerobic digester on farm or at a wastewater treatment plant. They can produce electricity to feed themselves or the grid. And again, power the grocery store, 
power your house, power the other operations. When we look at projects for Walker Industries, we, this, this is, has to be there. We, we need to make money. We're, we're a company. But we also look at the environmental and social aspects. Some people call it triple bottom line. We like to call it our C model. Um, this is our sustainability wheel. When we're looking at new projects, we always think about the social aspects, how we're developing our people, our partners, our communities. We're looking at the effects to air, water, and land for environmental. And then we're looking at our bottom line. I'd like to have an example of today, I drove one of our fleet vehicles. It's a Chevy Bolt. It required zero um, gasoline, zero diesel. It's 100% electric. Um, it's good for our people. I like driving it. It's quick. I can get from zero to 100 in 5.6 seconds. That's faster than my big truck, and it's a lot cleaner. Um, for our, our partners, so we bought it from GM. So we're supplying them landfill gas. They're supplying us with electric vehicles. We have it nice, nicely painted and branded. Our community sees that. They, they av we advocate on behalf of that. We're, you, know, you can talk to us about how we like the, uh, the Bolt, and we'll definitely give you our, our uh, impression of it. It's obvious that it's good for emissions. And I got here uh, with about less than $3 in charge. Try to do that on the most fuel efficient Civic. You can't find it, right? So it's good for our bottom line. We invest a little bit higher of a premium to pay for that car, but we get it uh, paid back to us uh, within our, uh, our hurdle rate. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me here and I'm uh, here to answer any questions. Uh, Mr. Dave Thompson, uh, uh, has uh, Walker in Environmental has handled petroleum sludges? So paper, uh, yes, we have. Yep, for uh, Abbott Tibby, our neighbor, yeah. we have handled uh, 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 biosolids. Then my second question is, in the, pro in the process of uh, uh, making a renewable natural gas, RNG, you, uh, you take out CO2, you know? CO2, carbon dioxide, separate two. What do you do with that? It goes to a thermal oxidizer currently in the hybrid system we're looking at. We would like to utilize that CO2. Dr. Simakov's uh, research project is one way of doing that. He's, uh, I think Dr. Simakov has got a project to make methanol out of it. Me methane, we could make methanol. That's, yeah. that's another way of doing it. Yeah. Okay, we could sequester it as well. Uh, that would be another option. Um, yeah, so there's lots of, uh, of options. You burn the landfill, right? We burn the landfill yeah, gas, how, uh, yeah, which, we have to flare it. What, uh, which is the process? What's the process? What's the process? Okay, so we don't need to condition the gas at all to flare it. So we have a blower which uses less electricity than our compressor. We don't need to compress it to 35 PSI. We can, uh, you know, have a blower and it, it's pushed at about, you know, 5 PSI to our flare. And we have a, uh, it's called a totally enclosed flare, so there's no flame. And, uh, and really, you just feed in the landfill gas. Uh, you start it up with propane, and you flare it. It's really simple. So you have to give propane in the burn, right? To Only to start it. Once the landfill gas at 50% methane goes to it, it doesn't need any propane. And in your, I think previous, uh, previous question. So in your process, you get around 30 to 40 methane. Only. You get 30 to 40. Methane. Methane. M methane. Oh, um, we run our landfill between 45 and 50 percent methane. Um, we can change the way we cap, the way we capture gas, to maybe increase it to just over 50 percent. For other biogas applications, like anaerobic digesters, you can get as high as 60, 65 percent. And most of other gas is uh, carbon dioxide. Yes. And you want to recycle, or maybe you, you can convert this to natural, natural gas as well. We can convert yes. that to renewable natural yes. gas, to methane, um, through a couple right of different now, systems. One how that we're you can separate the uh, carbon dioxide from methane? Well, in the research we're doing, we actually found that it's better. Instead of installing uh, membrane separation, uh, which is 
very capital intensive. If we put it into a reactor, add in the hydrogen, and do the reaction in a reactor, um, we get the benefit of the methane coming in and then converting the CO2 to meet pipeline quality. So we have not done much research in just taking a straight CO2 stream and then um, getting in that hydrogen and reacting it. We can probably do it, I just don't know what quality you'll get at the back end. For your membrane, you will use your catalyst together with your membrane to convert your CO2 to um, you just separate? Currently, our RNG project would just be to separate that CO2 and bring it to the thermal oxidizer. So I think if you can do in situ, catalyze for this process also as a short one step, not only separate, but you can do further. Correct, yeah, yeah. If we, if we had a reactor instead of a membrane separation unit, yes, we could, we could convert that CO2. Yeah. Now, I mean, if you can yield in situ, in, you yield catalyst, oh. so that you can convert CO2 right away through this membrane, right? You could, yeah. Uh, we haven't, I haven't been involved in, in much of, of that, but you're saying, can you take the CO2 within the well field yeah. and create the methane? That would be a very interesting project. Because right now, a lot of people, they use in situ process so that they can convert right away. You don't need an extra step or another right. step to, to convert it uh, and separate and then convert to the right. natural gas. After this, I'm going to give you my card. If you could send me some information on that, we can talk further. Okay. Great.